Hi everyone, welcome to this talk. My name is John. I'm an open source engineer at Hackages. And during the next 25 minutes, we are going to talk about the web. <laughs> In my opinion, the web is an amazing platform. Uh, and I think that we can all agree on one fact is that it, the web has evolved a lot since its beginning. We went from sending simple uh, text over the wire to providing a full experience to the end user. And I think one key component within the web that has brought this experience is JavaScript, right? But so JavaScript, built in 1985, uh, shipped within the Netscape browser, was aiming to provide some dynamism to the static content of the web. But uh, what we were trying to achieve with JavaScript at that time, it's a much more, it's a much smaller part of what we are doing with it now. So the way that, that it was executed at that time is quite different from the way it is executed nowadays. So at that time, JavaScript was interpreted, okay? And to take a closer look at what interpretation is, is, for example, here we have in the middle our interpreter, JavaScript interpreter, okay? And on the right side, we have kind of like the bare metal machine, the CPU. On the left, we have a bunch of JavaScript code lines calling add functions, passing numbers. And when the execution hits the first line, it, the line is sent to the interpreter, the interpreter does his job, okay? Evaluates both parameters, their type, what we are trying to achieve, and then outputs some machine code that gets directly executed by the CPU. Next line, same process, again. Evaluating both parameters, saying what kind of types they are, and then outputting some machine code. And the thing here that this mechanism worked until kind of 2005, when big JavaScript apps started to come onto the scene. And one example is uh, Google Maps, which, st which uh, browsers started to hit kind of like a performance issue with those JavaScript apps. And why? Because at the end, doing a simple addition in JavaScript is not trivial. You have to check both operands types and regarding their, their uh, regarding the evaluation, you, you, will, you will output some different code. So you cannot really count on the language by itself. You have to wait until runtime. So one of the mechanisms that uh, browsers applied to solve this issue, it's a very well-known mechanism, which is called just-in-time compilation. And if we take back the same example, uh, we still have both uh, items there, but you have a third one, a third component uh, within the system, which is the just-in-time compiler, okay? We take, again, the same lines. First line is sent to the interpreter. It does the same, evaluates, interprets it, outputs some machine code, and that's it. Second line, same process. Evaluate it, both parameters, and then output some machine code. But this time, the interpreter has monitored the code and the execution, and it has some feedback about the execution. So it's, uh, you can see that, okay, we try to um, execute twice the same function, passing twice numbers. Why don't, so it marks that function as hot and then pass it to the just-in-time compiler to compile it and output some, the same machine code that it was previously outputted, store it somewhere, else, somewhere in memory, and lock the, that memory region so we cannot override it. Third line comes to execute it. And then there, the interpreter says, OK, I know this add function. It's not the first time. I just asked the just-in-time compiler to, comp to compile it and put it somewhere in memory. So, all still are still both parameters numbers? Yes? OK, you can then take the one that I just compiled it and directly execute it. And if you see this here, what we have done, what the, the engine have done is just that he made a shortcut for the execution of, of a function. And we call that a fast path, OK? And that's when JavaScript gave us his top speed. And just to show you the difference between non-jitted code, so non-jitted JavaScript and jitted JavaScript, I just launched a, 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 an instance of Chrome uh, disabling the optimization of JavaScript. And you can see for 8 robot dancer, it's kind of laggy on the left side, but on the right side, it's kind of going very well. 
You can even, I think I increase until 15 and it's still okay. But then, well, we had the performance issue with JavaScript, with interpretation, we compile it and it works pretty well. Why, don't we, why do we want to go further? Well, the thing is that I didn't tell you the whole story. If we go back to example, and they, this time I'm sending, instead of two numbers, one string and one number, the interpreter will try again to say, okay, I know this function. I just store it somewhere. But all the, are still those two pa parameters numbers? Nope. So what he's, done, he's doing is that he is going to fall back to interpretation and erase the compiled version that he had. Uh, yeah, super animation. So at the end, what's the problem with JavaScript? Well, I mean, not the problem, I don't want to offend you. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. And uh, then what's the thing? What, what JavaScript is lacking to be optimized before execution? Well, JavaScript is just lacking predictability. If you take the same version, uh, the same, uh, the I mean, two versions of the same code, one written in C and another in JavaScript, you can clearly see that in C, the language provides some hints to the compiler so he can optimize code before runtime. When, if you look at the JavaScript side, there's not much going on there. Even the number of parameters are not really fixed, so you can pass more than two if you want. So if we quickly recap, what we learn here, or no, maybe what we have to. So we, opt we can optimize JavaScript, and it's cool. Uh, and you can have really good performance with it, it's not a problem. But the thing is that JavaScript is not predictable. So um, the industry, browsers, ha have tried to solve this problem. Uh, I mean, to solve that, to fix this. And they tried to run some more predictable code within the browser. And one of the initiatives is, for example, portable native clients from Google, uh, which was to, uh, to um, run some, uh, some C++ modules within the browsers, uh, sandboxes, so it's, it's secured. Uh, but it didn't really took off. Um, after that, Mozilla came with an idea of just taking a subset of JavaScript, which was more predictable. Um, with, and they call it they call uh, they call it ASM.js, but it wasn't enough because it was still JavaScript at the end. And in 2015, um, browsers reunited and um, tried to come up with something that they could agree on to go a step further to push the limit of the web. And that's where WebAssembly came onto the scene. And what is WebAssembly? If we take quickly just the the text from the official page, which is quite dense. I'm gonna read it. So WebAssembly, abbreviated WASM, is a binary instruction format for a stack-based virtual machine. WASM is designed as a portable target for compilation of high-level languages like C, C++, Rust, enabling deployment on the web for client and server application. <laughs> a lot of things, huh? We are going to try to read it again, but step by step. So WebAssembly, abbreviated WASM, is a binary instruction format. So it just means that it's a set of instructions encoded in a binary way. So it's quite efficient to load it. Designed as a portable target for compilation. So two things here. Uh, portable, it means that WebAssembly is not just designed for the web, but it's also designed to run outside the web on other platforms. And target for compilation means that you don't have necessary to write WebAssembly. It's quite low level. You are more kind to, you're more likely to write in a higher level languages like C, C++, Rust, Go, C Sharp, Java, whatever, and you compile to WebAssembly. So how the process goes? Simply, you take a bunch of files, C, C++ here, I just, okay, I mentioned just C and C++. You compile it to an intermediate, intermediate representation. Uh, it's almost always LLVM. I will skip the details about LLVM, okay? But normally this part is quite hidden from the developer perspective, okay? And then you compile as a backend compilation to a simple, dot wasm in this case is the name, but a wasm module, okay? 
and uh, with uh, which tool, for example, one of the main tools to compile to WebAssembly is Emscripten, which first mission, mainly mission, is to provide, to bring other languages on the, on the web. So then how do you consume this simple that wasm? Well, you fetch the resource. I think you all know this. You fetch the, the resource, and then you just call the JavaScript API, WebAssembly APIs that are nowadays available in all, all, all the browsers, the major browsers, and then you receive, um, uh, you receive a WASM module which you can call function on it. Here, exported fun. And those functions were originally written in another language. So what are the goals of WebAssembly? WebAssembly wants to be performant, run at nearly native speed. After that, WebAssembly wants to be portable, okay? So not only running on, on the web, but also running in other platforms. And secure, secure by default. It's one of the main concerns of WebAssembly, being more secure than JavaScript. Performance, well, um, I might disappoint you, but JavaScript is not uh, I mean, sorry, WebAssembly is not so much faster, so more, more faster than super optimized compiled JavaScript. At the end, they quite run nearly at native space, space, speed. Sorry, But the thing is that um, JavaScript, I mean, WebAssembly will more likely to stay on the fast path when you have a, an optimized version of it, while JavaScript will kind of de-optimize easily and falls back to interpretation. And for, to illustrate my point, here you have um, a multiple, just a diagram showing multiple execution of the same code in JavaScript and then the same code in WebAssembly in blue. WebAssembly is faster, okay, but the point here is to show that for multiple execution of the same code in JavaScript, you don't have, you cannot predict the performance. While in WebAssembly it's quite the, almost the same. Also, WASM can be decoded, validated, and compiled in a fast, single pass, equally with either just-in-time or ahead-of-time compilation. If you check how um, JavaScript is handled within a browser, you first fetch the whole resource, and then you parse it, compile it, and execute it. All that in the main thread. There are some exceptions, okay? Not everything happens sometimes in the main thread, but that's kind of the regular way of doing it. But browsers handle WebAssembly in another way. So the, while fetching the packets, while fetching the resource, the WASM modules, the browser will directly compile the bytes that are on the fly. And when, it, and when, it, when it's done, it will execute on the main thread. And the compilation doesn't happen on the main thread, so it does not block users. Just to show you the difference of performance, you have 30 robot dancer here, and you can see that in JavaScript it's quite laggy. When you switch the execution to WebAssembly, it goes back to normal. And you can even increase the number, and I'm going, I'll go there until I think 120. But you will not see the difference because the screen is too short, yeah. Okay, so portable. Um, at the beginning, WASM was uh, meant, the first version of WASM, it was meant to, to, to at least uh, works, work on the browser. So the way of execute WASM was to uh, provide some GS glue code that when a WASM module was trying to do something that the browser couldn't handle, at least the JavaScript will handle the code and in, simulate something, emulate something. For example, calling a file system. You cannot call a file sy system within the browser. So when uh, folks tried to uh, run WASM outside of the, of the browser, what they tried to do is just to run the existing WASM module outside the browser. And uh, so they were kind of emulating GS glue, GS glue code that was emulating a system interface. So it's not really the, well, the most optimized way to do it. So a need of, uh, as much as WASM is a language for uh, a conceptual virtual machine, it needed, um, a system interface, a, standard, a standardized system interface for a conceptual operating system. That's when WebAssembly system interface came onto the scene. It's just a specification that uh, runs, uh, that, that WebAssembly modules can uh, call 
to uh, make some system APIs call. Kind of, it's just an operating system. It's not, it's, it, let's say it's kind of like a POSIX way of doing it, okay? So then the diagram becomes like that. You have the non-browser or browser runtime that implement WASI and provide, expose some system, a system interface API that WASI modules can interact with. I wanted to show you one um, tweet of uh, Solomon Hikes, which is the, the founder of uh, Docker, that's, that is saying that if Wasm plus was existing in 2008, we wouldn't have needed to create a Docker. That's how important it is. It is WebAssembly on the server is the future of computing. A standardized system interface was the missing link. Let's hope Wasi is up to the task. Also, folks from Clever Cloud, a French company that is, I think, here, maybe you have met them, uh, are running function as a service in WebAssembly directly on the hypervisor, so no operating system between the, the, the code and uh, the, the hardware. Okay, WebAssembly wants to be secure by default. Nowadays, when you code, uh, it's the, 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 the result set of binaries is just 20% your, that your code and 80% dependencies that you haven't written. Um, then what happened is that the way that we execute programs nowadays is just they execute within the ambient authority. So me as an admin of my machine, I'm going to uh, ask my program to run and then I'm going to provide him my whole set of keys, the permissions that he can, so he can run. Maybe he doesn't need it, but it's okay. I just wrote the code so I know it, does, it will not do some malicious things. The problem is that it also passed the whole set of keys to their, its dependencies, okay? And sometimes you have a malicious dependency, okay? So that malicious dependency can then use all the rights that you provide to execute some malicious code. WebAssembly wants to execute itself as a, uh, capability based systems. So it means that I still have this whole set of keys, but when I'm going to run the whole program, I'm not going to pass all the permissions. I'm just going to pass the permissions that I think my program needs to perform his task, okay? So uh, I'm just passing here uh, kind of one key, and then this key is passed to all the other dependencies. But this time, the malicious code is quite blocked and cannot really perform the malicious task. Also, one abstraction that uh, WebAssembly wants to provide is called nanoprocesses. So the, um, the idea here is to execute competing modules, WASM modules, in, this, in, the same, uh, in the same process. So kind of the, the result is kind of like that. So you have the whole process, which is like the big box, blue box, and then inside you will have like the first one is like, like your main module, the one that you have written. And, uh, uh, it has dependencies to other models, but they all run within kind of in a sandboxed way, and they, they think that they are alone within the, the, the memory space, the process. It's, it's just a software fault implement, uh, isolation. So, why uh, WASM wants to be secure? Because first, it provides capability-based systems. Also, it's sandboxed by default, okay? So you can run low-level code in a secure way. And also, it, uh, nanoprocesses provide a way to, um, to uh, communicate between um, different modules a lot, lot, lot much faster than uh, inter-process communication, okay? And the end result is kind of like that. So you write your first, uh, you write your main module in, for example, Rust, and then you consume some dependencies that were originally written in other languages, like C++, Go, and so on. I mean, there are, a lot, there are not only these languages. Huh? Um, there are a lot of more, but voila. So projects. I just took two examples. There are a lot, okay, but you can check. Uh, as you are all JavaScript developers, uh, I wanted to show you AssemblyScript, which is just 
it's a subset of TypeScript that does not compile to JavaScript or transpile to JavaScript, but compiles directly to WAS modules and web assemblies, okay? And because I'm a .NET guy, <laughs> I wanted to show you, I'm also a .NET guy, <laughs> I wanted to show you um, that you can run now uh, the CLR, so the, the .NET, with, on the browser through WebAssembly. And they provide now kind of a framework which is quite similar, of, like Angular, to uh, write front-end applications uh, in C Sharp. Go check this link, it's really interesting. Uh, there are a lot of things, and that guy, Embasso, uh, I think he's Italian, and he's doing, um, a C++ front-end library to write a uh, front-end application that compares to WebAssembly, and it has also provided kind of like GA6 syntax for C++. It's super interesting. The bytecode alliance. Um, so big companies reunited and tried to push WebAssembly and a secure by default web and they call themselves Bytecode Alliance. They are, these are the four uh, uh, founders of the Alliance, and uh, you see pretty big names, and just to tell you fastly, it's running 10% of the internet. And I will end up my talk with uh, one quote that I think it's can, kind of resume what I feel about WebAssembly, is that WebAssembly is the first fast multi-language retargetable and safe intermediate representation that we have a that we have ever agreed upon as a community. CTO of Fastly. Voila, thank you. Okay, any questions? Uh, I have a question about Node.js. So in Node.js, yes. you can run uh, native C++ yes, modules, of course, and yeah. you can run uh, Waza. Mm -hmm. What do you think uh, is better uh, to run on Node.js, Wasm or C++, and why? Uh, it's a question that a lot of folks are asking. Um, to be honest, I think that uh, for now it's C++ that will continue to, to be like the major solution to, uh, to provide native performance within Node modules, but at the end it will switch to WebAssembly modules. Uh, because, I don't know, in my humble opinion, I think it's kind of like the future of the industry or in, the, in this perspective. Um, but they all, they, they both fix, solve your issues, which is giving you performance mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, hi, um, WebAssembly is a fairly young language. Um, do you have an overview of the tools and uh, debugging tools uh, around it? Because as it's a binary format, uh, I guess it's a little bit harder to debug than, uh, let's say, vanilla JavaScript. Yes, okay, so uh, there are already, I think, some browsers that provide uh, debugging tools uh, to uh, work with WebAssembly modules. Uh, you have, I think, within Mozilla, uh, Mozilla Firefox, you can already kind of work with it and, and, and debug it. Uh, the, the thing is that, I didn't mention, and you, you're right, uh, WebAssembly has two representation. It has the one that uh, browsers use to uh, to execute it, which is the binary format because it's load efficient and so on. But for human readable, it's it's not the most human readable uh, format. So they ha also have a text uh, representation, which is WebAssembly uh, text, I think, <laughs> what <laughs> or something. <laughs> it's called what, <laughs> um, and then you can really clearly see that it's low level, kind of like an assembly code. Uh. Uh, I have a question about uh, the micro front end and how WebAssembly will do in in this uh, in this architecture. So assembly. Yeah, WebAssembly. WebAssembly uh, will do in which architecture? In the micro front end. The micro front end architecture. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, WebAssembly are quite. Um, I mean, it's composed of several modules. So um, if your concern is to say. Uh, do I have to download the whole module, big, big, big module to execute it? No, you can kind of speed it, and, and in the in the future you will able to you will be able to lazy load it. So, yeah, I think you can already do that now. To be honest. because at the end, as you see, as you saw, uh, I mean, you're just fetching a resource on the internet, and then you can fetch it whenever you want. If it's 
Sorry? Yes, I will say yes, yes. There is no, really, they're not competing. I mean, if they're loaded into your browser, you can run it uh, on both sides. But maybe you will struggle a bit to make them uh, work together, but I think it's completely feasible, of course. Okay, uh, is WebAssembly uh, able to access to the GPU? Okay, so uh, this talk that I've done, it's normally much, much larger, and I've co covered all the topics. Uh, one thing that, so your question is, uh, is it possible to call uh, some GPU APIs from the WebAssembly? Uh, right now, no, because the only thing that provides uh, that, uh, that is standardized is WASI, which is kind of like a system interface to call some uh, the OS APIs. The thing is that uh, WASI wants to extend itself, and so you, in the future, uh, you would be able to call some specific, domain-specific uh, low-level APIs, kind for example, GPUs, okay, or you will be able to call, I, I don't know, something related to blockchain or whatever. So go check uh, WASI, go check on the internet, WASI, it's really, they, are, they really want to extend themselves and, and they're open to, to feedback from the community. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I will, uh, so if, if you don't know, he might be available just outside for questions. Yes. Yeah. So the exit. Look